Father in heaven, we come before you again on these Sabbath hours, praising you for your goodness, leading us in our lives into this marvelous light. And Father, we pray that you continue and we cl claim the promise of Yeshua that you would lead us and guide us into all truth and show us things to come. Father, as we're coming to the culmination of this age of your plan of salvation at the return of Yeshua, we ask that you continually guide us into all truth. We pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we have been looking at, you can see what's behind me there, we've been looking at some of this stuff. We were looking at um, the harlot of Revelation chapter 17 and kind of going back in some of the prophecies and see how that equated with the little horn of Daniel chapter 7 and also Daniel chapter 8. And we saw glimpses of that, although not called the little horn, in Daniel chapter 11 through 12. Daniel 11 through 12 is different uh, from Daniel 7 and 8 in that it is literal. So it takes the the symbols from Daniel 7 and 8, and it puts them into literal terms. And once we understand that, then we can put some real uh, players into the picture and see what's going on. And we're going to touch uh, just a little bit on that as well. Daniel, we haven't spent too much time in Daniel 11 through 12. It's the most comprehensive uh, of world events that are going to transpire, I believe that is just ahead of us and a uh, very, very important part of the prophetic uh, picture of the time of the end. So we were looking at the harlot and the beast of Revelation 13 and we we're talking about the harlot is, I believe, to be the papacy or the Catholic church per se that's led by the papacy that's the spokesman obviously we're going to see a change in the papacy right now we have a, a liberal pope if you will and uh, i believe that he's seen a move in this global movement right now he's seen a move with the climate change or, or you know all this all these things about uh, climate change, global warming, or global cooling. It's all part of a, a, a plan to bring the world under one head, which we're all aware of right now, led by the likes of the Klaus Schwab's of the world, Bill Gates, and so on. And so the Pope has seen for himself to make his move. And, and what's been coming out of the papacy is, is that he is aligning with these people. But there's, as in every church right now, there's a conservative movement that is rising to the top. And I do believe, as I've been saying, they will gain control of the governments of the world. And it'll be out with the liberals, who seem to be just fine going with this new world system that's coming in. Even the Christians that are of the liberal, liberal variety they're thinking that we shouldn't do anything about this. We just go with the flow and, and leave the results with God. It's, it's a simplistic way of looking at things. And so the liberal side of this is, is just fine if we go with this new world order. They don't want to cause a fuss. Um, but there's the conservative side that recognizes that we are in a spiritual battle. So we're going to go from one side of this pendulum all the way across to the other. And we're starting to see the pendulum start to swing right now in the exchange of the world governments is this conservative movement. Uh, we've seen this in South America with the Argentina and El Salvador. And there's movement in Europe as well, the conservative movement. That's what this, uh, this farmer... Um, thing is and the tractors going through all the streets blocking all traffic and all these uh, demonstrations pretty much are happening uh, worldwide and so this is the conservative aspect coming forward and really the conservative aspect is is from the Judeo-Christian 
uh, roots that are in it because they recognize the evil that's coming and they don't want to have any part of it. So we're going to see the pendulum swinging from this liberal all the way across to the other side. And when it gets all the way to the other side, that's when trouble happened. So this is what we're looking at. And so when this pendulum starts to swing, which it's starting to swing now, that's a go time for those that are uh, really of the true faith. And that's going to create all kinds of opportunity for us to witness because people are going to be more open to what the prophets are saying because this whole movement, this conservative movement, is going to be a push back to God's word. And um, a lot of people are not seeing that, but this is, this is really where it's going. And we have the prophecies to actually show that. So what I want to look at to kind of wrap this little thing that we've been on, on the harlot and the little horn, and then this beast of Revelation 13, which is an amalgamation of the kingdoms of the world. We've looked at that, shown how... That's from Daniel 7, which were literal kingdoms. And then Revelation 13, the lion, the bear, and the leopard, um, and that fourth beast all come together in that seven-headed dragon that has the mouth of a lion, the feet of a bear, and the body of a leopard. All of these kingdoms now have come together with the harlot riding it. And one of the aspects of this kingdom in Revelation 13 was it received a deadly wound. And we talked about that, that deadly wound. It tells us a little later in Revelation 13 that the deadly wound was caused by the sword, which is war. And this is the war that we have coming right in front of us. And we've seen even more indications of, of that even this week that we're going to look at as well. So we see a conflict coming with the the three prominent world religions, the ones that seem to have most effect, and um, that would be Christendom, Judaism, and Islam. And it's very interesting that you have three that claim their heritage to Abraham, and they're going to square off. This family feud is actually come to the place where we're going to find out who is going to be number one. And... Uh, so that's, that's really what we're looking at here. And that's the, the deadly wound uh, that is on that, uh, that beast. And we're going to be looking at that. And what we want to look at now primarily today is the false prophet. A false prophet points to a false religious system, uh, a counterfeit religious system, if you will, and so this is the, the role of the false prophet. It's interesting that it's called the false prophet in uh, chapter 19 of Revelation at the time when Yeshua comes. And it tells us who this false prophet is. It goes back to Revelation 13, and the false prophet is the second beast that comes up. So I would propose, if what we're saying is true, and the first beast is made up of the kings of the earth, primarily led by that seven-headed beast, the European Union, and Russia being the bear, lion being the uh, UK, and China being the, the leopard, the body of the leopard, the biggest part of that beast, which is quite interesting. So if that's the kings of the earth, and now we have a second beast, I would propose if we're going to stick with the pattern, then that second beast has to represent kingdoms of the earth. Now that beast, we're told, as we're going to see, has two horns like a lamb. So we're looking at some other beast that is not included in that first beast. And we remember that that first beast was wounded by the sword, and yet the beast lived on. But the interesting um, thing that it doesn't have that, that Daniel chapter 7 has, it has not got the eagle's wings. So the eagle's wings we talked about, that was what was uh, taken off of the lion, separated from the lion. And also in uh, Daniel chapter 8, that was the large horn that was broken 
once that goat became very great. And that goat that became very great was made up of those four kings. We saw this in Daniel chapter 8. Those four horns that came up are the same as the four beasts that came up and is the same as the amalgamation in Revelation 13 that does not have the United States. So the question is, the United States, is it ripped off of the world and has no part of the God's, uh, God's uh, demonstration of what's going to play out? No. The United States is the false prophet. It's that second beast with two horns, and that's what we're going to focus on today. We're going to be looking at that. So the question when people talk, start thinking about a false prophet, they're not thinking in the terms of really what the prophets say, the true prophets say, uh, what, the, what the false prophet is. And so they're looking at some person. They're looking at this power being a person. Uh, we should be asking bigger pictures, is it a church? Is it a political entity? And this is really what we're looking at. If we're going to be consistent with the prophecies and see that that first beast is made up of kings, is it possible that that second beast is made up of kings? And when it talks about the false prophet, it's a system, just like the little horn is a system that's led by a political slash religious entity being the papacy as a state and a church combined, and that's what leads the world into uh, its destruction, really. So here we have uh, false prophet cause and effect. This is something that we can see in the prophecies as we follow through in the prophecies. It really is God's revelation of a cause that leaves an effect. It's just like you know, dropping a ball off the roof of your house, it's going to hit the ground. And so this is, uh, you know, by definition, I just wanted to look up the definition of cause and effect. In the cause and effect relationship, one or more things happen as a result of something else. Pretty basic. A cause is a catalyst, a motive, or an action that brings about a reaction or reactions. A cause instigates an effect. An effect is a condition, occurrence, or result generated by one or more causes, effects, or outcomes. Now, I want to ask you the question, does Satan understand this principle? So he's laid out, I would propose that he's laid out, in order for him to sit in a temple claiming to be God, he's got to bring the world to the place where he can do that. The whole issue here is over worship, without question. And we can go back to the life of Yeshua when he was led into the wilderness. This is, this is, this is kind of confusing to me. It says the Spirit led him into the wilderness. For what purpose? Well, it says to be tempted by the devil or tested by the devil. So I believe what we're facing here in the future is that the 144,000 will be led into the wilderness and they will be tested as Yeshua was uh, in the wilderness by the devil. What was he tempted? Primarily the focal point was if you will bow down and worship me, I will give you all of this. And that's really ultimately what Satan wants, is he wants the worship. He wants to demonstrate to the whole universe, and we have no idea the vastness of that. Uh, we claim that we think we understand, but I can guarantee you we have no idea of the vastness of God's kingdom. And so Satan wants to declare to the universe that this, these beings that God has made would much rather worship me. If you give them the freedom, if you give them the freedom, they would much rather worship me. And we saw this in the time of Job, and we see this now, that people, what they're doing now is in the name of freedom. You know, those flags that have multicolors on them? That's all in the name of freedom. If you give people enough freedom, they will basically hang themselves in their own rope. That's, that's exactly true. But you give them enough freedom, and this world is going to be reduced 
to, uh, you know, really a bad place. And Satan's whole plan here is to demonstrate that when God made man, he really did make a mistake. And so he's trying to take the whole world down to the place where they will worship him as the coming Messiah. So the question is, how is he going to do that? Well, the prophecies are a revelation of exactly how he's going to do it. We don't need to guess. We can just look at the prophecies and we can see from cause to effect, he's going to do something that is going to, he's going to do something that will cause an effect to get us to A from B, and then he's going to do something else from B to C. So the whole thing is going to be a cause to effect, cause to effect, cause to effect, all the way down until he's finally worshipped. And that's the beauty of the prophecies, is that we need not be surprised at exactly how this is going to happen. Okay, so we can look uh, at Matthew 24, and I haven't got Mark 13 here because Mark 13 basically is a carbon copy. Very little change from uh, Matthew to Mark. Luke 21 is the interesting one. It throws another dimension. When it's talking about the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24, that's, uh, that is the uh, day 1335, 12, 1290, and the 1260 days. That's in relation to those prophecies, the abomination of desolation. And we get that from Daniel chapter 12, also contained in Daniel chapter 7. And Daniel 8, we see another time frame. And all these time frames fit together, revolve around the daily being taken away. And we know that because that's what it says in those prophecies. But interestingly enough, Yeshua refers to Daniel and says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. In other words, we better understand what's going on. That's something that Yeshua said. Let us understand. The wise shall understand. We see that in Daniel chapter uh, 11 and 12, that the wise will understand that. And surely we want to be amongst the wise. So Yeshua starts, as we've been looking at, deception. He warns right out of the gate, deception. The very next sign is war. So what, what he's talking about is there's going to be deception everywhere, right at the beginning, and we're going to see war. I would propose that there's deception coming that is revolving around the war that's coming. And I'm hearing people starting to say, oh, we've got uh, Gog and Magog, Russia's going to come down on Israel, and it's all going to be, you know, we're shaping up for that war. Well, when we go back to Daniel, we can see that that's not the war that Yeshua is referring to. He's talking about the war that's directly in front of us, although there are wars and rumors of wars, which we're going to look at. The war that Yeshua is referring to comes from the book of Daniel, and that's the war with the three great uh, religions of the world, Christendom and Judaism and Islam, that's the war that he's talking about. Interestingly enough, is he was very well aware of the promise to Abraham that Ishmael would become a great nation, and it says that he would fight amongst his brother and it would be just a disaster all the way through history until it came to the place where uh, the sons of Ishmael would declare that Allah is going to rule the world and they will make their move. And this is where the West and Christianity will make its move to stop this. And that's what this is talking about in Daniel chapter 8. And that's the war that will bring the world governments together the world governments that are not run by Islamic uh, nations, and they will come together because they will realize at some point that their real enemy is Islam because they're not going to have part of that system, that Islamic system uh, of, of Islam that wants to take over the whole world and create Sharia law everywhere. Then after the war, Yeshua tells us it's famine. So that means that there's going to be a war that's going to bring famine, pestilence, 
there will be natural disasters all at the same time. Do you see a cause to effect here? We can see this thing going all the way through. As we go from one step to the other, it's bringing, the whole thing is bringing people to the place where they will make an appeal to heaven. However, it will be a counterfeit gospel, if you will, uh, in their appeal. It will usher in a false messiah ultimately, but you can see how the world is being uh, groomed to get to this place. Even tells us there will be fearful sights and great signs in the heavens. That's taken from Luke. Uh, so we're combining some of these prophecies from Matthew, Mark, and Luke together. There will be false prophets. This should be a plural there, false prophets. Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles and the times of the Gentiles for three and a half years. We see this. Many people have struggled with the time of the Gentiles. How long is the time of the Gentiles? Is it the time when Rome uh, sacked Jerusalem in 70 AD and it's been under the times of the Gentiles ever since? We need not guess what that. It's very clear when we go to Revelation chapter 11. It talks about a 1260-day period and a 42-month period, which happens to be the same time period that the little horn ends up in Jerusalem when we looked at that as well. So we're seeing a progression for the purpose of having Satan uh, sit in a temple uh, claiming himself to be God. So after or during this time of the Gentiles, when they gain control of Jerusalem, the little horn sets up, the harlot sets up in Jerusalem, persecution will start. And uh, just like we saw in Daniel chapter 6, when Daniel was not to worship his God, and the only worship that was going to take place was the worship that was a state-approved religion. Because at this time, it's going to be very clear to the whole world is that we cannot have all these different religions. We've got to have one state-approved religion just the same way uh, it was instigated in the book of Daniel. What people missed and they failed to see is they're looking at Daniel chapter 7 through 12 as if pretty much all gone in history. So they're not even looking at that. But what they're not looking at that is just as equal, equally as important, is the first six chapters of Daniel represent prophetic insights as well. Now, the first, the first chapter of Daniel talks about Daniel and his friends were given wisdom ten times better than those around them. Why? Because they had purpose to, in their heart not to defile themselves. I would propose if we purpose in our hearts not to defile ourselves against God, we will be given insights. We will be given insights that will... will be much the same as what Daniel and his friends had into the prophetic writings, and God will give us insights directly uh, in dreams and visions as well. So these things are prophetic. Daniel chapter 2, uh, Daniel uh, or Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, we know that, and he made a statue. Well, we know that that statue, everyone was going to have to bow down and worship it. Was that statue Nebuchadnezzar? No, it was an image to Nebuchadnezzar. Are you with me? Revelation 13, the second beast, makes an image to this system, this Babylonian system back there. And we can't miss these uh, parallels. So when we get to Revelation, when we see the harlot, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, controlling the whole world, the second beast makes an image to this system and causes all those where it is on the, in the world to worship the first beast. And so we see that in, in that chapter. Revelation uh, or Daniel chapter 3 is that uh, event when that happened. Revelation, or sorry, Daniel chapter 4 is when Nebuchadnezzar had a little bit of a pride issue and, and looking around, seeing all that he had done, God had reduced him to basically nothing. 
caused him to eat the grass of the field like the animals. And this is what happens when the world comes to the place that it takes the place where, where God really exists. Instead of giving him the glory, the human beings take the glory, and that's what's going to happen to the world. They will be starving through this time, and they will come to the realization that they are actually not in control of their destiny. There's someone else. So we have, in the time of the end, Satan is trying to get control of the world, and God is allowing this to happen so that people will reach up and uh, worship him instead of themselves and Satan. So we have these events transpiring that are evil of a magnitude that we can't even imagine at this point, and it will bring on persecution by these powers, uh, hatred by all nations for God's true people, and some of them, it tells us, will even be put to death, and the love of many will grow cold. And, and again, I want to go through this as a cause to effect. So when they're putting us to death, what will be our first thing that comes out of our heart and we'll be voicing? This will determine whose side we will be ultimately on. If we are cursing these people, I would say we're being led to our love being growing cold because iniquity abounds out there in the world. They're persecuting us. We want to hang on to the love, the unconditional love that Yeshua had and Stephen displayed, displayed at his stoning when he said, Father, do not hold this sin against them. That's the words of Stephen. And also when Yeshua said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. We do not want our love to go cold, grow cold, but continue to pray for these people and, uh, and that they would see the light before it's too late. And tells us here, he who endures, he who endures in the love of God until the end, our love cannot grow cold. And to the end, the actual end, when the judgment has been made and every decision for good and, or evil has been made, we can see in Daniel chapter 8, this is day 1150, which is the 2300 evenings and mornings. If you haven't seen those videos where I talk about this, how I demonstrate that the 2300 evenings and mornings is not actually 2300 days or 2300 years, but is a 2300 uh, evening and morning in relation to the sanctuary, the context of the 2300 is sanctuary language, which turns into 1150 days because there are two evening, or there's an evening and a morning sacrifice. And people say, well, the word sacrifice is not supposed to be there. That's right, it's not supposed to be there. Just as Daniel had his morning and evening back in chapter 6, we can have our morning and evening without a sanctuary uh, sacrifice or a blood sacrifice as well. So this, this taking away of the daily is going to affect something that's going on in Jerusalem and also something that's going on in our experience with our God in our appointed times in the morning, in the evening. Goes on to say the gospel will be preached in all the world and then the end comes. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation at 1290, that's from the time that the daily is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1290 days. Those are bookends, the daily ta being taken away and the abomination of desolation set up. All these events that we're looking at, except for the war and what brings this on, from the time that Jerusalem is trampled by the Gentiles, that's when the clock starts. That's the daily being taken away is the Gentile nations are in control of Jerusalem. Why do I say that? Because before the time that they're in control of Jerusalem, there is a sacrificial service taking place. In fact, all of the feasts are being celebrated in Jerusalem. Many people will be traveling, traveling to Jerusalem prior to the three and a half years taking place. 
Um, many Messianics that I know will be uh, traveling to Jerusalem to offer sacrifice, yes, even offer sacrifice uh, at the temple. Uh, however, this will be halted by this Gentile movement that is, is growing even today. And this is what we're going to be looking at. Therefore, when, they, when we see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, that's a temple in Jerusalem uh, speaking of the counterfeit Messiah, uh, let the reader understand. We have to understand this. At that time, we're told there will be great tribulation during that time. We thought we had great tribulation before. It's going to intensify at the time of the Antichrist system that comes in. And the Antichrist that comes is not a man. That's what people are thinking. It's this person or Prince Charles or somebody else, some Islamic King power Charles. even. King Charles. He was prince for quite a while, wasn't he? <laughs> King Charles. Yes, we're seeing some shakeups in the uh, monarchy in England. And so this is all going to develop. But these people, although they're influential, uh, they, they definitely are not the Antichrist when we put all the evidence together. So we're going to have a great tribulation when this Antichrist comes. At that time, there will be false Christ. There will be false Christ showing up all over the world. And there will be false prophets showing signs and wonders. If possible, even the elect would be deceived. Well, that tells me that the whole world is going to be deceived. And this is what the prophecies say, except for that few uh, elect. And at that time, it tells us there will be uh, signs in the sun, the moon's going to be dark, and the stars will fall. And it will be at that time when Yeshua uh, makes his arrival at day 1335. So let's look at some developments that are happening right now, shall we? Sheets in 2013 is given a white flag with a green pine tree in the center, and it says an appeal to heaven. This is actually a flag that was commissioned by Commander-in-Chief George Washington as part of the Revolutionary War. It flew over the Massachusetts Navy. It's a quote from the philosopher John Locke. And the idea is when we human beings have exhausted all of our appeals to unjust governments, in the end, we make an appeal to heaven. And he begins, starting in 2013, rolling out a spiritual warfare campaign built around this appeal to heaven flag. So if you're on the inside, you know that the appeal to heaven flag is the symbol for this very prophecy, spiritual warfare driven form of Christian nationalism. But on the outside, it just seems like it's another patriotic symbol. When it comes to January 6th, if you go through the footage of that day, there are dozens of appeal to heaven flags all over the place around the Capitol this Dutch seat, Sheets, and he is one of the main uh, backers of Trump, and he's causing a lot of other ministers to go on, and we're watching some of his stuff. Uh, you want to get a real idea and a sense of what these guys are up to. You want to just plug into some of their videos, some of their recent videos, and they are pushing very hard for Christian nationalism, which which is really, it's such a, a well-devised plan to take over the United States. There's a fine line between the truth behind it and the counterfeit that's behind it. On the surface, it looks really good, and it is good in the sense that it's a spiritual awakening in the United States. But there, um, there are a lot of people that are really against this. And of course, the left is really against this because they see that this Christian nationalistic movement is going to make laws that go against their freedoms. And you know what the left is talking about, all the freedoms they want. They want to be able to kill all the babies they want. They want to be able to do whatever they want. Uh, in the sexual realms and, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah type of, of things. 
and they also want to let anyone come into the United States. And this is where it gets quite interesting, in my mind, is that, uh, you know, we look at this border and we see the NGOs, these non-governmental organizations that are mostly churches, but not all churches, and they are aiding the United States government to bring in all these people. Well, the idea is when Christian churches get involved in this, what they think they're doing is helping all these people, bringing them into the United States where they're going to be fed and housed and, and all of these things. But when we actually look at the Bible, we can see that God told Israel to don't have any part of this. So the Christian, Christian nationalists are, are saying, they're declaring that the United States was based on Judeo-Christian values, which it was, but there's no doubt that the enemy of souls had his, uh, his organizations working. And so when the United States was formed, it was actually formed by people that were fleeing Europe and coming over so that they could have freedom of worship. Most, almost all of those that signed the Declaration of Independence were Christian. They had Christian beliefs. Not all were of the same faith, but different faiths. There was only one Catholic that signed the Declaration of Independence. But primarily, uh, they were of Christian background. They, they understood those concepts. And even with the framework of the Declaration of Independence, they, they deemed it as the, that was the year of the Lord, and they, they appealed to God in that one nation under God. And so this is the background, and the Christian nationalists want to revive that beginning of their heritage. However, it may have gone too far, and the freedoms that has, have been allowed because of Christians, they think that we should allow everyone to come in here, and that has changed the whole dynamics of this Christian nation. But as they're looking back in the Old Testament, seeing how God uh, declared that Israel was supposed to keep the laws of, of God, and they were supposed to put to death all these different aspects of, uh, you can read these things in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers, and you can see there were definitely restrictions so they want to basically set up a theocracy uh, that Israel had, and this is where it's going. So the, the cause of the effect, this backlash, is the evil that we're seeing, and the Christian movement now is saying enough is enough. And this is the time that I was saying this is where we want to really get in the mix because this is going to help us uh, as we push forward as well to share people, share with what is going on. And we can see this actually unfolding before our very eyes, these movements, and how it aligns with what's going on in biblical prophecy. This was an article by PBS, uh, Christian Nationalism, Why It Raises Concerns About Threats to Democracy. Well, last time I checked, democracy is... Uh, the power of the people, the vote of the people. So if the nation votes this in, how does it affect democracy? Well, this is how it affects democracy. Once these people get in power, once they start making laws to do away with certain things, they, they will take ultimate control and the end of it will do away with democracy. But as long as we have a democracy, then there's no reason why these people cannot gain control, and this is how they're going to gain control. Out of this uh, article, it says, one of the most frightening things I think about Mike Johnson, who this, this uh, video had some things about Mike Johnson, is the flag he hangs outside of his office, an appeal to heaven flag. The appeal to heaven flag goes back to the Revolutionary War, George Washington. It was inspired by John Locke, as we just saw in that little video. So they're, they're suggesting, the left is suggesting that this is a sign. They need to read the signs. The sign is this flag 
that they have done everything they can, and so now they're appealing to heaven. Well, when they appealed to heaven back in the Revolutionary War was when war broke loose. So what they're saying basically by this, it's almost codified unless you knew what it was talking about. They're saying that the next thing that's going to happen is there's going to be war in the United States, a revolutionary war, just like has happened before. So they're saying that they're gearing up for this. But over the last 10 years, the Appeal to Heaven flag has been popularized by Dutch Sheets. That's that minister. Dutch Sheets sees the Appeal to Heaven flag as a symbol of Christian revolution. If you look closely at January 6, you will see dozens of Appeal to Heaven flags. It may have a long history, but in contemporary context, it has a very specific meaning. So the fact that Mike Johnson has it hanging outside of his office, to me, signifies how he understands his role as Speaker of the House in terms of being a Christian and being an American. So what they're saying is they are going to push to have a revolution, whether that's by force or whether they're just trying to take over the country, raise up the alarm to Christians saying their country is being taken over and they will revolutionize uh, the nation by their Christian roots. Uh, Laura, Lauren Bulbert, who is uh, in the House in the conser conservative movement, there have been two nations created for God's glory, Israel and the United States of America. We will glorify God. So this is just, you know, one of many um, that could be used here, but it's the, it's the movement that's gaining ground, and, and this is all the, the movement that are behind Trump and, and all that movement that we see gaining control here in the United States. So the question we want to ask ourselves, what would be better? Would it be better for us as Christians to have the left in control, which we know where that's going, or would it be better if we had the other side, the right, in control? Well, that, I'm going to leave that for you to grapple with. Um, because any of you that live in the United States, I don't know if you vote or not, but you will be faced with that decision. We know where the left wants to go. That's a, a new world system sooner than later. Uh, that's a system that brings everyone, including many, many terrorists, uh, from whether it be China or the Middle East or even South America, that opens the door to that, and that, to me, is a pretty serious thing that we're going to see here before too long. We're going to see this, this terrorist thing unleashed like we've never seen it before. So do we allow the United States to be taken down in that fashion? Or do we go on the right that wants to stop all that and close the borders and ship these people out? So that's quite a challenge, but the thing is, both of those are going to end in disaster. So I would say we might want to consider the lesser of two evils. We might want to consider the lesser of two evils that will give us more opportunity and will shelter us at least for a time from the storm that is going to be unleashed no matter what choice we make. We see in Revelation 13, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to receive a mark on their forehead and on their, uh, or on their right hand and on their foreheads, that no one may buy or sell except the one has the, the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So we see this is what's coming at the end of the road. Here is wisdom, let him who understands calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man, uh, his number is 666. So this, this power, this is the false prophet. So we see this is the end of the story when the whole world will come under one head, one religious system, 
headed by the pope, headed by a conservative pope, and that this whole world will be governed by this religion, which the ones that were once Protestants will have come back into harmony with the Mother Church, and they will be in subject to the Mother Church. And that's in Revelation 17, where it says the Mother Church has daughters. The Protestant uh, churches are made up of many different churches, uh, but they will come under the head of the Roman Church in the time of the end. How is this all going to happen? We saw, we talked about the idea that the nations of the world will unite, and uh, here's what's going on. We've been talking about this just yesterday. Russia says 60, de 60 dead, 145 injured in a concert hall raid. Islamic State groups claims responsibility. This is what happened just in Russia. We've been saying that Russia, yeah, has allied, its, allied itself with the likes of Saudi Arabia now, that the United States has fallen out because of what's been going on in the United States. They are leaning more heavily on China and Russia, and a lot of Middle East countries are. Why? Because they have the same enemy in the United States. And so they are allying themselves, but the reality of it is, uh, when Islam wants to take over the world, they have an enemy, and that is people that do not submit to Allah. And we're seeing just little glimpses of what they're going to do when push comes to shove, and they have everyone in position all over the world, and the world will wake up to the reality is the real enemy is Islam. And this is the war that we're talking about, that Yeshua spoke about, this war, rumors of wars, pointing us back to Daniel, seeing a goat from the west that's made up of an amalgamation of kingdoms that will come against Islam and destroy Islam. And from that time forward, there will be that state religion that we're talking about. So what happened? Assailants burst into a large concert hall in Moscow on Friday and sprayed the crowd with gunfire killing over 60 people, injuring more than 100, and setting fire to the venue in a brazen attack just days after President Vladimir Putin cemented his grip on power in a highly orchestrated electoral landslide. And uh, some articles suggest that there was some cheating. Who would have guessed uh, some cheating that would have happened there for that electoral landslide? It's just what he needed in a war with Ukraine is to have an election that would solidify him in power, getting his grip in power. So it's interesting that this seems to be on the heels of that election. Would that tell us something about the Islamic State, uh, that they do not actually like Putin? Why don't they like Putin? Ultimately, Putin recognizes the Orthodox Church as their state religion. Interesting. That's a Christian church. So Russian recognizes that the Christian church in Russia plays a major role, and Putin has allied itself with that. This is nothing different than the time of Constantine when he allied himself, a Roman emperor allies himself with the Christian church and makes laws. This is not only going to happen in the United States, but will happen in Russia as well when Russia actually comes under the attack of uh, Islamic uh, organizations on a major, in a major way, it will, be, it will be joining with the United States and the Western powers to defeat Islam. And we can see that these are just little warning signs. The Islamic State group claimed responsibility for the attack in a statement posted on affiliated channels on social media a U.S. intelligence uh, official told Associated Press that the U.S. intelligence agencies had learned the group's branch in Afghanistan was planning an attack in Moscow and shared the information with Russian officials. Why is this important? Because the United States intelligence is sharing intelligence with Russia 
uh, on Islamic movements worldwide. And this is how we're going to come together. So here we see a cause to effect. We're seeing things building. It says in Daniel 8 that this ram with two horns that was led by the kings of Media and Persia, which is exactly where this is, kings of Media and Persia, and they were pushing westward, it says, and they were pushing northward. Well, you don't have to look at a map too long to see what's north of the Middle East, and of course, that is Russia. So at some point, they're not only going to be pushing west hard, they're going to be pushing north hard, and that is going to bring Russia into alignment with the Western nations. And also because Russia is allied with China, it will bring China into the mix as well, because China, uh, if we've been doing our homework, has problems with Islam as well. And when they make their move, they're going to make a worldwide move to bring Islam. Uh, and the infidels uh, will be the target. And the infidels are anyone that doesn't believe in Islam. And this is where we're going. So we can see that this war that's shaping up uh, that will bring the whole world against Islam is going to happen because of cause and effect. We just need to watch the news and we can see what's going to cause this effect to happen as we, we've been watching this now for several years. October 7, 2023 will forever be a day of great tragedy in Israel. Since the Holocaust, there hasn't been a tragedy that great in Israel. Hamas attack was devastating for Israel, destroying entire communities, killing at least 1,400 Jewish people and kidnapping many innocent men, women, and children. But there is also another story behind these horrible events that not a lot of people are aware of. We are receiving information now that October 7th happened as a reaction to what was happening and what is happening around the Temple Mount. 100 days after Hamas attack on Israel, Abu Obeidah, the military spokesman for the Hamas Al-Qassam brigades, gave a television speech about the Hamas efforts, as well as reminded of the purposes of the war. In his speech, he says that the attack was to defend the Temple Mount, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and the Dome of the Rock from the Jewish plans of sacrificing the red heifer. In September 2022, the perfect red heifers were imported from Texas to Israel. As of now, the red heifers are blemish-free and are being prepared for a sacrifice that will change the status of the Temple Mount. A special altar is already built and the Temple Institute plans to perform the sacrifice of the red heifer before this upcoming Passover. And why is this important? Because it can trigger the events that will lead up to the building of the third temple. Okay, so these are events that are happening in the world that are a cause to effect. A lot of people, when this thing first happened, I was trying to do some homework on, on why, would they, why would they do this. The, the story back then was that there was something that happened on the Temple Mount. Some people went up to pray. Uh, some Jewish people went up to pray. And they were protecting the Temple Mount from the, the Jews that want to actually rebuild the temple. It was, kind of, it was kind of not clear what was going on. And of course, mainstream media, everything has been really quiet about this. But when you do some actual digging, this seems to be the story. Nothing is done in a vacuum. And so the Muslims are fully aware of what the plans of the Jewish people are and the Christian world. The Christian world believes that the Jewish people have to build a temple uh, before the Messiah can return. They believe that the Jews will be converted when the Messiah returns and so everything's just going to be wonderful. We're going to have a utopia here on earth for the thousand years. 
This is mainstream Christianity thinking. Uh, a lot of Messianics believe basically the same thing, that the temple has to be built in order for the Messiah to return. And they believe when the temple's rebuilt, then the Jewish people will accept the Messiah, the ones that the Messianic people have come to accept and the ones that the Christians have come to accept. Although all these things are happening for one purpose. Satan is planning all this. The controversy is, is God behind this temple or is the Antichrist behind this temple? We know through prophecy that Satan is going to sit in a temple claiming to be God. Where is that temple going to be? Is it going to be in New York? Is it going to be in Ottawa, Canada, Los Angeles, or maybe in Dubai? Where is this temple going to be? Well, we don't have to think too hard and long to realize that the prophecies are very clear. There will be a temple, and a lot of people deny this, oh, it'll never happen. No, we're seeing things in, the wor in world events that are declaring, screaming at us, that this is the direction. This backlash, I do not doubt it, um, that this thing that happened in Israel was a warning. It was a warning to the world, is leave the Temple Mount alone. We know, if you do some homework on this, uh, on this, this idea of the red heifers, that's to prepare for the Temple. They had to cleanse the area, cleanse the people, and, um, and this is what the Muslims believe. They know what the books of Moses declare, and they know this is a sign that they are planning on taking over the temple. So this was a pushback, if you will. Um, it's not something that you're going to find in mainstream media, like you're not going to find a lot of things in mainstream media. Because the fear of the world is World War III with Islamic forces, which have now moved into all the world, and it's only going to intensify as long as they don't shut the borders down. It's going to get really nasty. And this is a little warning to us of what they will do to the infidels. And make no mistake about it. They will do the same things they did in Israel to those here in the United States and in Canada. It's, it's been pretty much proven that these Islamists, Islamists were all drugged out to make them more aggressive, to do things that they would never do, never be able to do uh, if they were in their own right minds. And this has been something that they do. They, they put them on these drugs to do these things. We can't imagine the horrors that are going to happen here in, in this country and in Europe and in other places in the world and this will be what causes, this will be the, the cause, the effect to go against, uh, against Islam and rid the world of this, uh, this movement. There's also something else that's happening uh, in the world, and that is the, um, the movement away from the American dollar. We want to be aware of that. We want to see what's going on. The BRICS nations, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, formed this alliance to move ultimately away from the American dollar. Why did they want to do that? Well, the United States dollar has been weaponized in recent years for quite some time now. Um, putting restrictions on nations that they can't buy certain things that have to be bought in American dollars, uh, like oil and, and other things, that they can't buy these things because they need American dollars to buy it. So what these other nations are getting a little tired of this, so they're going to, their plans are to create a system that will bypass the American dollar. And this is what we see going on. The, the most important part of this is now this is growing to many other nations in the world. We want to just look at this. Video As of February here for a 1st, moment. 2024, significant developments have occurred within the BRICS bloc, Saudi Arabia, along with for other countries, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, 
and the United Arab Emirates have confirmed their joining of BRICS. This expansion follows an invitation extended to these nations during a summit held in Johannesburg in August of the previous year. Okay, so we can see here just a short clip here that talks about the BRICS nations. If you want to read about that, you can see what's happening. This is a cause and it's brought an effect. So with the United States using their dollar uh, to whip people, if you will, has made an effect that people are going away from the United States dollar. Why is this important? Because we can see in the prophecies the eagle's wings are going to get ripped off and the large horn that is in first place in the nations of the world, it says, will be broken. And the system of the world will move forward without the United States. And we can see exactly how that's shaping up. The prophecies are, are telling us that the United States will lose its dominance in the world. And we can see this. We can just watch the news and see how this is happening. Everything, As of February 1st, 2020. Whoops, sorry about that. We can see here LifeSite News. This is a... Uh, news uh, that a lay Catholic person that's in the conservative side. I like to go to these sites to see what's happening on the conservative side of uh, the religions and that's how I know where we're going. I'm seeing what the prophecies say and I'm seeing how the world is lining up with the prophecies. This is the conservative side uh, of the Catholic Church, one of many um, uh, websites that have been developed in in uh, the reason is is because the ha these have come up because a cause and effect again the liberal side of the Catholic Church they are calling out this liberal side but they also have lots of other things on this website that show the direction of, of the world and where it's going this article here is that uh, talking about gold breaks 2200 an ounce for the first time amid inflation interest rate chaos it's also very uh, very interesting that the BRICS nations are buying record amounts of gold why because they want to have their own currency that is actually gold backed it has something of substance uh, that backs it unlike the American currency uh, all that's backing that now is paper. They print, uh, they print dollar bills continuously without having any backing. And the world governments are starting to, uh, to have their, own, their plans to their, for their own currency. And it will be gold backed. And also the interesting part of that is the United Arab Emirates and, the, um, and Saudi Arabia have joined this movement as well as well as Iran so you can see the the shift in the power of the world and how you can see clearly how the United States ultimately has to go down uh, for the world to move forward and we see this in Revelation 13 in the the lion the bear the leopard and the seven-headed animal going ahead uh, without the United States in the lead. So on this article, gold jumped to a record price of 22.2089 in early trading this week. That was just this week on Thursday, amid foreign governments buying up more of the precious metal to brace for changing economic conditions and expectations that the US Federal Reserve will cut interest rates. So when they cut interest rates, this is what happens is there's movements worldwide and of course the US uh, Federal Reserve uh, they are printing money and this is just not a good thing Bloomberg reports that gold's price set a new record rising 1.6 percent before dropping 0.9 percent continuing an overall rise of almost 10 percent over the past month that's huge the, the news follows China and other central banks stocking up on gold and, uh, and is considering particularly noteworthy that higher prices have persisted despite higher interest rates. So the world is getting very shaky on the dollar and they're creating a system 
that will take the place of the US dollar. So we see here that in Daniel 7 that the eagle's wings are ripped off the lion. The, uh, the, the working with uh, England, uh, the UK, and the United States, this will be ripped off. How will it be ripped off? It will be ripped off by the war that's coming. Daniel chapter 8 tells us of the war that's coming against Islam and these other nations that are involved. Once Islam makes its move again, uh, with the world, the United States will be broken after the war. It will become great after the war. What's going to happen after the war, before the United States falls from its height, the, the Israel nation will be allowed to build their temple and start their sacrifices again. And this is when all of that is going to happen. Now we see, uh, I, I watched a 60 Minutes uh, little uh, video on how China is raising itself in the world right now to take over the power from the United States. And of course, we know that the United States is going to fall. So if we're looking out there in the world, well, who would take uh, the place of the United States? Well, once we get back into the prophecies of Daniel chapter 7, which we've been going over, it says of the third beast, the leopard-like beast with four heads, it says that dominion is given to it. Once the United States falls, dominion will be given to the leopard. Is that going to happen? Well, we can see, yes, it's going to happen. I have another little short Our video zero. clip. Sitting in his office, surrounded by his most trusted advisors, Xi Jinping feels ready. Over the past decade or more, he's spent billions upon billions modernizing China's military. His nation now has nuclear weapons, around 500 of them and he's built one of the world's largest navies. Add to that the fact that China's military has more active members than any other nation with 2.35 million people to call on. He's going to bring war to the United States. But to do so, he has to carefully coordinate attacks throughout the Pacific. He knows that the United States has bases in Japan and South Korea, around 190 in those two countries alone, and a powerful navy that, though smaller than his, packs a lot more firepower. A full frontal assault on the United States without taking care of those problems first would be suicide. He needs to secure the Pacific, giving China a route toward the American mainland as a priority. His attack doesn't begin with missile launches. It starts on the cyber front. For years, China has been working on cyber technology that would allow it to hack into American infrastructure and military defense systems, limiting America's response to an attack in the process. On occasion, China gets caught out. In December 2023, for instance, the United States conducted an operation to disrupt a network of small office home office or SOHO routers that China had taken control of using the KV botnet to mask its hacking activities. That was unfortunate for Xi, but it won't stop the first stage of his attack. So we see here that China is working on a plan here to gain control of the world. And if it knocks out the United States, it will then control the world. There isn't a nation uh, that, can, uh, that can really go against China once the United States is taken out. So their long-range plan is to control the world, and they're positioning themselves to do it. That's why it talks about here that they've got to gain control of those islands off the um, east of China, and Japan would be part of that and South Korea, another area that they need control over. And Taiwan is the first target that they want because that would push the United States off. However, they understand that they just can't do it in a moment because the United States has quite a bit of uh, firepower over in that area along with these other countries that would help as well. But this is what's on the horizon. We can see, and the prophecy indicates, that China will take over as number one, uh, number one in the world, just as the prophecies say. So when we look out in the world, we can see exactly how that's going to happen. So let's get back to the prophecy, shall we? Revelation 13, 1 and 2. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, 
and on his head ten crowns, and on his head's a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and the mouth, the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So here we've been looking at is Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, Revelation 12, Revelation 13, uh, verse 8, is all of these chapters are coming together and telling us the main world kingdoms that are going to be involved at the time of the end. And lo and behold, when we look out in the world, we can see this development. And this mouth that speaks great things, we saw in Daniel chapter 7, it was the little horn. Daniel chapter 8, it was the little horn. And we saw, we looked at some verses in Daniel chapter 11, which indicate that this little horn is the one that enters and comes in peaceably, does not have an army of its own, but it's given an army by the kings of the earth. And it ends up in the glorious land as we see in these prophecies when we put this together. So the United Kingdom being the lion, Russia the bear, China the leopard, and the mark of the beast comes through the European Union because that's where the harlot is. And it's this fourth and dreadful beast that's made up of ten kings, but three kings are uprooted, and the harlot reigns over that and spreads its influence over the rest of the world, which is the Catholic Church, or the Catholic meaning the word universal church. They want to be the universal church that rules over the whole world, uh, led by the little horn or name of the harlot. Revelation 13, 5, And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. This little horn power that speaks blasphemies in uh, Daniel and uh, great things is given authority for in Daniel, it says, for time, times and a half which is the same time period we see in Revelation 13. Is it a different time period or is it the same time period? We have to look at the possibility uh, that is definitely the same time period as spoken of in Daniel. Same entity is the little horn, the harlot of Revelation 13 that's given dominion over the world, rules the world, sits on all the kingdoms of the earth. That's what this beast is. The beast is none other than made up of the kings of the earth, the kings of the earth from Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8. And uh, these come together in the seven-headed monster that has the mouth of a lion, the feet of a bear, and the body of a leopard. And it is allowed to continue for this time period and it is interesting that this is the first beast of Revelation 13. Still yet for the second beast to come up. Revelation 13, uh, 5 goes on to tell us um, the heads. In Revelation 13, 5, I saw one of the heads that have been mortally wounded. Its deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. If we go back to Daniel 8 and see the war that begins all of this, we see the United States as the leader, as the notable horn. This is the deadly wound to the movement of this new world system that's coming to fruition uh, and builds even greater after the war. But it's sometime after the war, during the time which the... Uh, temple is going to be rebuilt in Jerusalem that will be backed by the United States. After this temple is built, the United States will be broken. And this will cause an effect, this breaking of the United States will cause an effect that the papacy, long held view of its dominion over Jerusalem, will, I believe, the prophecies indicate that it will move its headquarters to Jerusalem. This is what it says in Daniel chapter 8. The little horn goes south, goes east, and then goes to the glorious land, will end up in the glorious land, and take away the system that has been put in place, the Jewish system of worship that has been put in place there. Goes on to say, so they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast who is able to make war? 
Islam has been taken out of the way. No power can withstand this beast that's now made up of the major kingdoms of the world. And he, the beast, was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy, and he has continued for 42 months. This is this entity from Daniel chapter 7, this little horn power that's given time, times, and a half. And we see that same entity in Daniel chapter 8 that takes away the daily for 1150 days. Then judgment happens, the sanctuary is cleansed. And we see this, and it ends its reign at 42 months, or time, times, and a half. This power goes on to say, He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. This is that persecuting power, the one we saw in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, and again here in Revelation 13. It was granted to him to make war with the saints, to overcome them, and authority was given over every tribe, tongue, and nation. This is the power that's led by this little horn, the harlot power. He now gains control over the whole world. We saw this exact same thing in Daniel chapter 7. In the interpretation, it says that this power, this little horn power, consumes the whole world. So he has power over the whole world and all who dwell in the uh, on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life the lamb slain from the foundation of the world if anyone has an ear let him hear he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity he who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword uh, here is the patience and faith of the saints. So this is a call to the saints, be patient. Uh, God is going to have his way with this power, but it must happen. Why must it happen? It makes a line of demarcation between God's people and the world. You see, before Yeshua returns, there has to be a demarcation of those that are his and those that are not. In fact, it happens even prior to this, when the plagues are poured out, it's, the plagues are poured out on the wicked and those that are of the righteous, the, the plagues that are poured out do not touch them. And so there has to be a, a defining time in earth's history of those that are worshiping God and those that are not. Those that are not bear the brunt of the seven last plagues and God's people are not affected by those seven last plagues. However, I do want to say is they are not raptured. God's people are not going to be raptured uh, before this time. They are going to go through to the end. By the words of Yeshua, he who endures to the end will be saved. And we see the same context here. Those that have to endure to the end are going to witness all of these things happening. So this is happening in those nations where we have the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the dreadful beast all amalgamated by one, being led by the Roman Catholic Church, bringing its system of worship in. And once it gains control of the, the world on that stage, then persecution will begin. A lot of people think that this persecution won't begin again, but it will begin again as soon as the Roman power gets its position and control over the rest of the world. The fires of persecution will begin again when the Roman Catholic Church gains control over that part of the world. So what about this part of the world? Well, I believe that second beast, this is what we want to look at, that second beast, as we're seeing glimmerings even today in the movement on this side of the world, that this conservative movement is also moving forward as well. Cause and effect. It's seeing the evil that's coming. It's rising up. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and it had two horns like lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. We need to remember this first beast that comes up, it comes up out of the sea. 
and it contains those nations that are represented by those animals and it comes together with the papacy leading the charge and dictating to that part of the world. Well, what happens to the United States? It was broken off and now it is back on the rise. It's this other beast that comes up from a different area than the sea of nations, tongues, and people. And it comes up from a different part and let's see what it does. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence. So these, first, these two beasts are working at the same time. That's why it says in his presence. They're contemporaries. So in order for the United States to come back into favor with the world, because the world basically has left them, uh, and in order for them to come back into favor, they make a system that duplicates the system of the first beast that's made up of the other kings of the world, the seven heads that will gain control over Europe, the, and also the lion, the bear, and the leopard that are all under the system of the papacy. It comes along later once this system is in play, and it wants to join the rest of the world. So he exercises all the authority of the first beast. What is the authority of the first beast? Well, it tells us he causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So the push for a new world system in its early days, the United States was broken off. The new world system went forward without the United States. So the system that the United States wants to come back into favor with is the system that went forward when it was broken off of this system, creating this deadly wound. But the deadly wound, it tells us in Revelation 13, was healed. The new world system went forward without the number one player, which was the United States. Now the number one player that was broken off wants to come back into favor and wants to be a part of this new world system and this is what we're shown in Revelation 13. So the deadly wound that was healed on this first beast, the United States wants to come back into favor. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So this first beast is doing these things. Now how do we know who this first beast is? Number one, he's called a false prophet. We see that in Revelation 19. It says that the beast is thrown into the lake fire with the false prophet. The false prophet, it tells us in Revelation 19, and it tells us in Revelation uh, 13, 13, that this, this thing was wounded by the sword. So that's how we know the connections between Revelation 19 and Revelation 13. So this beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived, moved forward, this great, uh, this second beast comes up and we're told that it makes, does signs and wonders. What it's doing is pointing to the first beast. That's why it's called the false prophet because it, fa it falsely points to a savior in the first beast. But we can tell, and what we're going to see in Revelation that this first beast comes to nothing as well and the harlot is destroyed first. So the, the second beast is pointing to the system that the harlot is in control of and that's why it's a false prophet, deemed as a false prophet elsewhere. He performs great signs so he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of the beast. What's been lost in the United States was broken. It says that there's two horns on this beast. We can see here, if we look at today in news, we can see how this is actually going to happen. We've got a conservative movement uh, growing in leaps and bounds uh, today in Canada. And once this conservative movement grows to the point where it will join with the conservative movement and this push with, uh, with Judeo-Christian values, although they are apostate, if you will, we can see how that will make two nations, two great nations, come together 
to cause all to join the system that is in place, this worship system, uh, this Christianity, this apostate Christianity that's led by the Church of Rome, which is the harlot of Revelation chapter 17 that has spawned all these children. These, uh, she's the mother of harlots. And that's what we see um, with fallen Christianity is they are basically not too hard to prove. They follow Rome in great detail in its idea of Christianity. It's interesting that Barack Obama, uh, just before he left office in 2016, uh, declared that there would be a new national mammal in the United States. Um, it was represented by the eagle, but the new national mammal would be the bison, which interestingly enough is, is considered a great national monument in Canada as well. Quite a fitting possibility for a, uh, an animal that rises up from these ashes that are, are coming, still coming. This beast that rises up out of the earth has two horns like a lamb, much the same as a buffalo two small horns like a lamb. And we can see this developing how if a conservative movement grows in Canada, which it is, uh, it will very easily at the end of war and destruction that's coming, would uh, everyone likes a friend when they're down, these two nations could very easily come together. So in summing up, what do we have here that's growing? We have uh, the United States, once this New World system takes place uh, in the East on that continent, uh, Russia, China, England, uh, or UK, and Europe, once they come together with the, with the papacy leading the way, the United States will rise again as this second beast coming up out of the earth signifying a different landmass from the sea where all these different nations are joining together. When, Canada, when the United States and Canada come together, we will see here they will reach across the Gulf looking for a friend, embrace the system of the papacy, an image to the beast will be formed and a push for a one world order will be complete. We can see this all coming together uh, as we're looking at the prophecies, trying to make sense of the prophecies, how they relate to what is going on uh, on the world stage right now. One thing we should be aware of is that what God has warned us of the events that are connected to this time in earth's history. Why has he revealed these things? Quite clearly because when Yeshua returns, He's going to set up a new system and he will take his elect and those that rise at his coming to the Father's house to celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. We see that in Revelation 19. The controversy is raging within Christendom is what is going to happen when Yeshua returns. Is he setting up a kingdom here or is he setting up uh, a different system and we're going to have a thousand years of rest and quietness on this earth while the smoke clears and are the righteous going to heaven those that are alive at his coming and those that are raised uh, we've got other videos um, Judy will put a link there other videos that demonstrate what is going to happen cause to effect in order for the whole world to be deceived you can't miss this point. In whole, the whole world is going to be deceived except for the elect because Satan is going to be worshipped as God, sitting in a temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And the world, for the most part, is going to fall for it. And why? Two reasons. And we cover this in other, re other videos for two reasons. And basically two reasons only is people are not studying the prophecies for the time of the end and they're not
putting the, prof the prophetic calendar, God's prophetic calendar, into the prophecies to see what is coming and when it's coming. With that, I want to just encourage people to don't take anyone's word for it. Go back to the prophecies, study the prophecies, study God's calendar until you are satisfied that you have the light. And uh, I can assure you we're going to get more light all along the way. So don't put yourself in a place where you think you've got it all figured out. Uh, God has a system of revelation, and it is progressive. As we walk in the light, as he in the light, is in the light, he will give us more light along the way. So I want to encourage you uh, with those words. There is no stopping place this side of eternity. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you again for your word, which is sure, and we ask that you continue to lead us and guide us in it. Father, we want to give you permission to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We ask that you finish the work that you have started in us, that we would be ready for your return. We pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen.